Good morning, everybody. Um, this is my daughter, Lauren. She'll be chipping in every so often. And uh, every so often, she may force-feed me grapes, so I'll have to stop. But uh, we'll, we'll take that as it comes. So what I want to do is talk to you about a, a career in science. And um, now, science careers, of course, are, are science. And scientists can be very, very varied. So I thought I'd start with a career I know quite well. So I'll, I'll tell you a bit about um, my career in science to date. And uh, so and I'll show you how my career in science has weaved in with my life. So this is actually a picture of me <laughs> when I was a bit um, older than my daughter here. So I think I was about two in this picture. And um, I'm actually gazing down at, um, I don't know if you can see, there's a green caterpillar in front of my feet. So even as a, as a child, I was quite fascinated by science. This shows sort of an interest in biology. But um, what I was really interested in was the stars. Uh, yeah, I know, that's mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the reason I was interested in the stars was because of these guys. These. Uh, does, actually, does anyone know who these guys are? The cl oh, I, see, I see many shaking heads. Uh, these are the clangers. And as a child, I watched the clangers avidly. I thought the clangers were fantastic. And if you've ever seen an episode of the clangers, it starts saying, you know, and now we're travelling into deeper space to the planet of the clangers. And I used to watch this when I was about Laurie's age. And I was like, wow, I want to go into space. I really wanted to meet the clangers. Now, most sophisticated and sensible people would grow out of this. But for me, as I've grown older, my desire to get into space has just grown with me. And so and that has been one of the mainly, main driving forces of my career. So you need to be quite careful because you don't know what could influence your future career course. And so as a child, I just used to keep on looking up, up at the sky. And um, I was brought up in a Camden. And I used to walk across Hampstead Heath um, when I was going to school and, and coming home. The fluffy things. And um, uh, going across Hampstead Heath is actually a wonderful thing to do. But sometimes on a clear, still night in winter, you go across Hampstead Heath and it's dark. And there are no street lights there. And suddenly you see the stars in brilliant detail. Now, as a Londoner, I don't often get a chance to see that. And so that also inspired me. But it wasn't just the stars that inspired me. It's also... Oops, sorry. She's taking over the talk. I knew she'd do this. <laughs> it was also the people who had been into space. People like Yuri Gagarin. People like Neil Armstrong. You know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I was born in the late 1960s. And, um, oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're just uh, breaking up the place. I was born in the late 1960s, so things like that were fascinating for me. Um, I, I wanted to sort of be Yuri Gagarin. I wanted to travel to the moon, and I still do. So um, uh, that sort of set up my career. Now, um, one of the strange things is, as I was growing up, um, I suffered from dyslexia. So as I was growing up, I hated school. And um, I, it just sort of, it just didn't agree with me. And uh, I always used to sort of sit at the back of the class, you know, skulk a bit. Because with my dyslexia, my reading and writing weren't very good at all. And especially um, early on in your school career, they play a very prominent role. So uh, I didn't envisage having an academic career at all. I, I, I don't, my mother wanted me to be um, uh, an actress. And so um, uh, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll do something like that. But um, uh, I was very lucky because at some point in my life, I got inspired and I got inspired by science. Now, I think it was partly the desire to go out into space. And I thought, well, see, scientists put people into space, so they've got to be good guys. But also, I found that I had an aptitude for science. I remember the first time I was in a class, and um, someone asked a question. And it was a very simple question. I can tell you what the question was, actually. They said, if you take um, a litre of water, and one litre of water weighs um, one kilogram, how much does one cubic centimetre of water weigh? I sat there in the class, and I put up my hand, because I thought, yeah, okay, it's quite obvious, it's one gram. And I sort of put up my hand, and then I looked round, and no one else had their hand up. So my gut reaction was, well, you've got to be wrong. <laughs> and so I was going to put my hand down, but I thought, no, you know, wing it, what the heck? And I was right. And I couldn't believe, you know, young Maggie you know, in the remedial class, sitting at the back, could get this question right. So after that, look, there's another one here. After that, I just got fascinated by science. And because it was a, an interest and a passion, I started reading around the subject. So um, not, I was reading about it in school, and I was reading about it at home. So suddenly, my marks started going up and up and up. And suddenly, I was sort of top of the class. And as the science was getting better, that was also dragging my other subjects up. So um, to, uh, I was starting to sort of making career choices, working, trying to work out what I was going to do. 
And uh, for my A-levels, I actually did physics, chemistry, biology, and maths, because I'm quite mas um, masochistic like that. But um, for me, I, I was fascinated by physics, because to me, physics is the study of everything. Chemistry tells me how processes in my body, biology as well tells me how processes in my body happen. And the mathematics is what knits it all together. Mathematics is the language of science. So I couldn't really work out which one to drop. Also, when I was growing up, my father really wanted me to study medicine. My father came from Nigeria, and he came to the UK, and he wanted to study medicine in the UK, but he never got the opportunity. So he thought, Maggie, you study medicine for me. You go out and you know, follow in my, my, the footsteps I wanted to make. But I decided that I just don't think medicine was for me. But I studied biology because it gave me an understanding of the human... Oh, dear. Sorry. <laughs> She's chewing it. <laughs> it gave me an understanding of the human body. So after that, I decided I was actually going to do a degree in physics. Because with... <laughs> I know, it's mummy. What's she doing there? And Ember. Because and he <laughs> That's three. <laughs> mummy takes over the universe. So, so um, by studying physics, I really got get, get closer to the stars, which is my, was my passion. And also it gave me an understanding of everything in the universe, from the smallest atom to the very galaxies themselves. So physics was definitely the subject for me. Now Next, for my PhD, I did a PhD in mechanical engineering. Now, this seems like a sort of a bit of a curveball. Why mechanical engineering? Well, for one thing, I was trying to look for a PhD in physics, and I couldn't find the right subject. Because in, um, in my last year uh, for my physics degree at Imperial, I started specialising in optics. And then an optical project came up in the mechanical engineering department. And for me, I, I just, when I first um, started studying physics, I thought, OK, I'm going to be the next Einstein. Theoretical physics, that's me. And, but as I studied and I did the mathematics, I realised, as a dyslexic kid, that just wasn't going to happen. And I found that I was more practical. And uh, one of the things I did is when I was uh, about, well, actually, about your age, 14, 15, 16, I made my own telescope. I actually got, um, I went to a telescope-making class and ground my own mirror. For me, this was the first instrument I made, and it was fantastic, because it's something I made with my own hands, and it got me closer to the stars I love. And so that sort of guided me in my career. And so I did a PhD in mechanical engineering in instrumentation, using optical techniques to look at all sorts of things, like engine oils and high-pressure contacts. So, finally, you know, I emerged from university. I am now Dr. Maggie Adarin. Uh, me, a doctor, just seemed quite mind-boggling, but I am Maggie Adarin, Dr. Maggie Adarin Pocock. So... My career! Now, unfortunately, when I actually stepped out of university, we were going through another credit crunch. They seem to happen every so often. And so I applied for hundreds of jobs and didn't find anything. And to me, this was quite soul-destroying. I had been at university for seven years, three years for my degree, uh, four years for my PhD. I've emerged from university, and I can't find a job. So eventually, um, I applied to the MOD. Now, for me, applying to the MOD, this was quite a bit of trepidation. Is that good? Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> for me, applying to the MOD, that was quite a bit of trepidation, because I think that is the fascinating thing about science. Science can be used for good, and it can be used for bad. And the idea of going and working at the MOD, I wasn't too sure what they wanted me to work on. So um, I got there, and I went for the interview, and I said, OK, so and what sort of things will I be doing? I said, ah... We can't tell you that yet, because you haven't signed the Official Secrets Act. But join us and we'll tell you soon. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so for my first job, what I was actually doing was I was working on a system called a missile warning system. And this is me trying to look cool. I needed some dark glasses, really. But this is me in my first job. Yeah, Mummy's in there. Look, that's me. And, and what we were doing is we were making um, a warning system that sat on an aircraft and would warn a pilot if a miss missile was coming towards them. Because pilots, as you can imagine, if you're, if you're flying an aircraft, you've got quite a bit on your mind. And if a missile is coming towards you, you can do something about it. You can actually, this is an infrared picture of an aircraft and um, what we call a pyrotechnic, a flare. So if a missile, a heat-seeking missile is coming towards you, what you can do is you can let off a flare. It burns big, yes, I know. It burns big and it burns bright. And the missile will go towards the flare and the pilot will be saved. But the problem is, as I say, if you're, you're flying along, you've got lots of other things going on. And so you might not notice that a missile is coming towards you. You might not set off your flare. So what we were doing is we were trying to work out what a missile looked like and then have an automatic system. Oh, good girl. Have an automatic system so that the flare would be let off automatically. Now, the problem with a missile warning system is you need to know what a missile looks like. And to do that, this was me. So my first job was actually hanging out of the door of an aircraft, taking pictures of missiles. Now, this sounds like a sort of slightly dangerous thing to do. And I must admit, as a scientist, I expected that I'd probably be working in a lab somewhere or, you know, playing with test tubes. This was more like James Bond hanging out on the backside of aircrafts. And it was fantastic. We were getting this data. 
And, but th the one thing I really loved about this job is this job had the potential of saving people's lives. It had the potential of making a real difference. And that's one of the powers of science. Science can make a real difference to people's lives. So that was my first job. I then actually took an active control in my career. And although I was still working for the MAD... Oh, you want this back? Thank you. And although I was still working for the MOD, what I did is I actually um, got a promotion and I applied for a job working in landmine detection. Now, at this time, landmine detection was a hot topic because uh, 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 Princess Diana was doing lots of work in the area. And landmines are a devastating problem. This is a map of the world, and it shows some of the areas where landmines are affecting people. And the problem with landmines is they are a very cheap and effective deterrent. You don't want someone to go into a certain area, you lay landmines, you just scatter them, you can scatter them from aircraft, you lay landmines, the first few people go in, they get limbs blown off, and they don't go in again. So it's a very detect uh, effective deterrent. The problem is, in places like Angola, where the war is over, the landmines are still there. You scatter them, but where are they? And so um, uh, what we were doing is we were looking at landmines. And also, one of the other things is some landmines are actually designed to, I won't say be attractive to kids, but they're designed and they look quite like toys. And this brings up another dimension of science to me. Because I was working on landmine detection, trying to find these things and deactivate them safely. But other scientists must have, and engineers, must have designed these landmines. So science is a double-edged sword. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I think with most science, there is an ethical dimension. So one of the questions is, when we say, why should people have an awareness of science? Why should people uh, sort of, um, study science until 16? I think it's important because science affects our... Um, our society in so many different ways. We need to make decisions about what science has been done. Um, many people have tried to ban um, the development of landmines, but um, they're still being produced in some areas of the world. But as a, a society, as a community, we need to be aware of the devastation they can cause and make a decision as to whether we want them or not. And um, a few years ago, I went out to Cambodia and I met some of the kids whose lives have been devastated by landmines. Landmines aren't designed to kill, uh, per personnel mines aren't designed to kill, they're designed to maim and cause major damage. So, again, working on this project was a, a major um, a step forward for me because it was a project that, again, could really make a difference to people's lives. But also, because it was such um, a hot topic, what I found is that um, uh, I was quite, call, uh, quite often called upon to speak to politicians. Now, this, was quite, this is an opportunity you're going to get today, and it's a very, very powerful opportunity. Because growing up, you don't often expect you to be able to speak to the great and the good of a country, to influence policy. And by showing people um, the sort of work we were doing, it was... They were making decisions on what will be done later. And so this is a powerful position to have, and it's a, a position that you have today. And also, one of the things I found out is by actually speaking to the politicians, by talking to them about the um, techniques we were using, the sort of fairly complex techniques we were using and simplifying it and making it accessible, I found I really liked that aspect of the work, and it, it didn't actually occur in my everyday, um, um, in my everyday occurrence. So... Then I went on to work in my favourite job, because at the moment, my dream was to actually work in space. And at the moment, I'm a long way away from that. But then I was able to turn it around, because I applied for a job to work out in a telescope in Chile. Now, this is the Gemini telescope, and it is an absolutely beautiful thing. It's in um, the foothills of the Andes in, in Chile, and um, this telescope is huge. It is an eight-metre telescope, so the mirror of the telescope is eight metres. Now, this is eight metres of light-gathering power. The telescope I made when I was a little child was only six inches in diameter, about 150, I know it was small, 150 millimetres across. So to work on a telescope like this, eight metres, was just fantastic. And also, because I think um, uh, um, telescopes like this are cathedrals to science. Every night, they'd open up the telescope dome just as the sun was setting, and the stars would appear. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, um, on a mountain like this, you're up above quite a bit of the Earth's atmosphere, so the stars are, are much, much brighter. And also, when you're in the southern hemisphere, you're actually looking into the heart of the Milky Way. And so as the sun set, <laughs> you could see amazing stars, and it just made my heart sing to see it. So for me, this was one of the, my favourite jobs. Hello, where's that going? <laughs> And what was I doing? I was building an instrument again. But this instrument, because you know in the old days you see you know, people looking through telescopes, you go up to the telescope looking through. But you don't do that anymore. If you look through the eyepiece of an eight-metre telescope, you'll probably burn your retina. There's that much light coming through. 
So instead, what we do is we take the light and we feed it through um, various instrumentation. And this is the uh, machine I was building. It was called BH Ross. It was probably worth about one and a half million pounds. And I was managing a team of about 17 people to build this. So we built it um, actually in the UK at UCL, then shipped it out to Chile. And I spent six months working in Chile. Now, what does BH Ross do? A BH Ross is a spectrograph. So what it does is it, it gathers the light from the telescope, sends it through the instrument, and then produces its spectra. So what we were doing is we were actually taking, yeah, I know, pretty. We were taking the rainbow of distant stars. And by doing this, we were actually able to look in the heart of a star and work out what chemical reactions were taking place. We could work out if the star was moving towards us or moving away from us by looking at the red shift or the blue shift of the lines of the spectra. So for me, as a child growing up, I wanted to reach the stars. But by making this instrument, I was doing the next best thing. With this, I could look into the heart of stars. So that was my career to date. And, and we built BH Ross, we delivered it, and then I was looking for my next job. And because I've been working in astronomy, I was able to get my dream job. I was actually be able to start working as a space scientist. Now, my dream is to still one day get into space, and I may never make that. It's, I always think it's good to have a, a, an amazing dream, a dream you may never reach. Oh, my love, oh, your dream is just to go to sleep, I know. Good girl. So it's, I think it's always good to have an amazing, amazing desire. And so my desire was to one day go into space, but I think now I'm doing the next best thing. I'm a space scientist, so I build instrumentation. But amazing. instrumentation, amazing. some of the instrumentation I, I build looks out into space, but some of the instrumentation looks uh, down here at planet Earth. And so I've been involved in quite a few Earth observation satellites. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> Sorry, I think she wants a feed. Sorry, Earth observation satellites. Satellites measuring parameters that influence climate change. So um, this is a satellite called Aeolus, which is due to be launched in about uh, two or three years' time. And it actually measures the wind speed in the Earth's atmosphere. Who are you waving at? So again, it's building things that can make a real difference to people's lives. Climate change is probably one of the biggest challenges we'll face um, as humankind in the next few years. So to be able to just make a small contribution to that just makes me feel very, very glad to be alive. And also, as well as building... OK, wrapping up, OK. As well as building things that look down on Earth, we build things that look deep into space. So, oops, let's go back one. <laughs> so, um, uh, I got to a point in my career where I needed to work out what I was doing next because I loved being a space scientist, but I don't think I was totally fulfilled by doing it. So I started doing things like this, a science communication. And as a result, I actually got an MBE from the Queen. So little Maggie, dyslexic kid from London, meeting the Queen of England. Mind-boggling stuff. But that shows how much potential you have. You have the potential to do more than you can ever realise. So now I, I also do some television work, and I, I'm an, at a bit of a crux in my career now, because I'm doing some television work, I'm doing some science communication, I've got my little daughter here, and it's trying to knit it all together. I see myself as a scientist, but at the moment I'm doing more science communication because of my uh, situation, because with science communication she can come along to the talks that I give, whereas I, I don't think you'd like sitting in the laboratory at, at work. So. I think um, it's, no, sorry, you've got to see that. Sorry. So I think it, it, sorry, this is us filming, and um, she was getting a bit cheesed off because I, um, my, um, the BBC were very kind because they, um, I did this documentary called "Do We Really Need the Moon?" and um, uh, I was, um, um, I actually got the email um, to do this documentary two days after Laurie was born, and they said, "Yo, do you want to make a, a documentary about the moon?" And I said, "Yes, that would be lovely." Um, do you know I've just had a baby? <laughs> So I met up with them and they said, yes, that's fine. She can come along too. So they paid for my husband to fly out and he'd look after Laurie while we were filming. I know, it's you. He'd look after Laurie when I was filming. And um, in the meantime, um, we'd made this documentary. It was hard work, but it worked. So scientists are people, everyday people like you and me, but they can make a real difference to society. And I think that's what you've got the opportunity to do today, make a real difference to society. Thank you very much for listening. So, thank you, Maggie.